Hello and welcome to this episode of the Clean Sailors podcast. I'm really looking forward to this conversation with two absolute experts on today's topic. Two people I greatly respect, admire and have recently spent time sailing with mid-Atlantic in the Azores, collecting and monitoring samples on this very topic, microplastics. Joining us is Dr. Christopher Pham, a member of various international expert groups on this topic, a research associate at the Okinawas Research Centre of the University of the Azores, specialising in marine litter, plastic pollution, deep sea ecosystems, and how us humans are impacting our oceans. Also joining us is Dr. Roman Lenner, a keen sailor and scientific project leader and co-founder of Sail and Explore Association. His specialism is microplastics and the even smaller counterparts, nanoplastics. Roman is concerned with the impact of microplastics on the human body and has instigated the world first research into just how these tiny pieces of plastic may be affecting the functioning and interactions of our very cells. So we are in great company on this topic and thank you both for joining. What are microplastics? Chris. Okay, so microplastics are actually plastic particles that are smaller than five millimeters. So within that smaller fraction, we have plastic particles that is below one millimeter, which we call really small microplastic, which you cannot see with the naked eye. And then you have particles between one and five, which are called larger microplastics, which you can see. And microplastics can come from two different sources. You have the secondary microplastics, which come from the fragmentation of larger items, larger, um, you know, big items, or even like ropes that are degrading. And then you have the, the primary microplastics, which are actually ma- manufactured as small particles. For example, those microbeads that you have in cosmetic products, but also something that we don't always remember, which is the textile, the fibers from the clothing. So there's, there's really a distinction between the primary pla- microplastic and the secondary microplastics. So primary are manufactured to be small on purpose. Like you said, I guess clothing fibers, microfibers are intentionally made that way and then secondary is obviously like you said being broken down from bigger pieces of plastic over time ultimately creating smaller and smaller pieces as they get exposed to uv salt water etc exactly and then nanoplastics too because that's obviously by definition even smaller i mean plastic microplastics is almost capturing the process of plastic degrading over time right it's part of a the middle of a sliding scale of plastic sizes yeah, nanoplastic is even smaller than one micron. But I think our colleague Roman can, can describe what really are nanoplastic and what's the origin, what's the sources. Because you can't see these with the naked eye, right? No, no. Everything that is smaller than one millimeter, you cannot see with the naked eye. But the nanoplastic, I mean, something even, even harder to, to detect, I think. But Roman, please. Yes. So, I mean, if you do talk about nanoplastics, we do talk about part particles at the size of 10 to the power of minus 9. Eh? So it's really, really small. And as Chris was already pointing it out, something that is smaller or thinner than a, a human hair cannot be, is not visible anymore with our naked eyes. So nanoplastics are super tiny little particles and they do have the possibility to enter or to be taken up by any kind of like tissue, like fish tissue, human tissue, you name it. And due to this small size, we do talk about different problems that might occur if you do look on those nanoplastics compared to microplastics. So why should we care? What is it about plastics and microplastics and them getting taken up by marine species and us humans and also, I guess, plant species? Why should we care about it? We should care really because it's something that is known to affect the biology and the physiology of of different marine animals. And the problem here is really like that there's a lot of microplastics, a lot of plastic generally in, in our ocean. And it's, it's, really a, it's really becoming something regularly ingested by a lot of different animals, down from the, the small zooplankton up to the, the big, large whales. We're still trying to figure out really what is the, the impact at the population level. So we know that there is impacts at the individual level. But how does that affect population? You know, how does that affect the, the reproductive success of different animals? And how does that change throughout the food chain? This is something that is quite still a topic of, of research because, as you probably know, the area of research in microplastic and plastic in general is, is quite recent. Probably 15 years ago, nobody would 
there was a few, you know, really few research paper on, on that subject. And this is something that is, is really uh, has been kicked off for the past 10 years. So there's a lot of things to discover. But I think it's quite obvious that any synthetic polymer being ingested by animals has a negative impact. Not only just the physical aspect of having something inside your body that is not supposed to be there, it's also the fact that it's carrying a lot of different toxic compounds that might leach into the body. So it's really something that takes time to understand. We know that in lab studies, we know that you can really identify an effect. Now in, in the world, it's something that we're still working on. I think that's a really interesting point around, obviously, they're not natural substances, right? So if you put plastic into into an organic system as an inorganic substance, it's likely to have an impact. One would imagine, and we'll talk particularly about what that might do to our human bodies with Roman in a minute, but obviously plastics are, are quite absorptive materials as well. So over time, they're also picking up other things that they're getting exposed to, and that could be bacteria and different viruses, whether it's in the water or out of the water, as well as having their own toxic substances, you know, chemicals from which they're created. So it seems like there's there's a lot of potential for them to be quite damaging. Yeah, sometimes they are referred to as little sponges that is floating in the water. So as you said, they're just sucking up everything that is there and they're accumulating. So we, we've actually, we've done that kind of analysis here in the Azores, looking at what sort of compounds we can find on those fragments that are really abundant here. And we're finding a lot of like heavy metals, persistent organic pollutants of different kinds. And the concentration of, on, of those chemical compounds are, is really high. So as you can imagine, if a seabird ingests a few of those fragments, it definitely has an effect on its health. So it's something really that we need to understand a bit more. But I think one thing I would like to, to stress is, is the fact that there's other stresses that are acting on, on those animals at the same time. That's the problem. And that's the, the challenge now that we're facing is trying to understand how those different stresses like climate change, plastic pollution, fisheries, you know, how all these are affecting those populations that are, you know, already endangered. So that is the, the real challenge. Separating out plastics from everything else, I guess, is your point, right? With so much going on. Yeah, separating out and then also trying to see how these they are in interacting. Plastic pollution on its own can probably be sort of dealt by the animals because they're, you know, they can deal with sort of of stress and, you know, impacts. But when you have different stresses acting on different parts of the ecology or the, the life cycle of the animal, then it's, it's getting a bit more, more complicated. And obviously we spent time together, the three of us, sailing in the Azores and trawling for microplastics. What is it about these islands in particular as almost like a proxy for other regions of the sea? Because they're mid-Atlantic, they're exposed to extraordinary weather systems, also being caught between two major Atlantic gyres. So they are almost perfectly situated to receive a lot of inbound material from other parts of the of the world and certainly from countries surrounding the Atlantic. What are kind of the things that you've been seeing and identifying in the water and with marine species, but also on the beaches? Yeah, so like you're saying, we're really in the middle of the, of the Atlantic Ocean. So we're actually really exposed to global pollution because actually most of the, the, the items that we're finding in our waters are not coming from the islands because as, as you can imagine, you know, the, that small population. And even though if we emit, of course, I'm not saying that we're not emitting any plastics from the, the islands. There's still a lot of things to improve, but we have quite an efficient waste management system. So what we're seeing on our beaches is really things that are coming from far away. And we are really exposed to basically everything that is coming out from continental shelves, from big urban centers that is, you know, flowing out of the, of the rivers, ending up in the ocean, being transported by these large current systems and accumulating really around our, our waters. And the fact that we are in the middle of the ocean also means that we're an important area for a lot of migratory animals. We're sort of the hotspot for all these different large migratory cetaceans, but also seabirds. And we are an important area for those animals. And our area coincides with also being a hotspot of plastic. So as you can imagine, it's quite a a risky area for those animals to be now. And what we're seeing really is, is that this is not, you know, this is not decreasing. We've been monitoring the waters, we've been monitoring beach litter, and we're not seeing any decrease in, in the quantities. We actually, some seems to see a little increase in, in the quantities and in the, in the amount of fragments that are, are, are stranding on our beaches. I mean, last year we found after a storm event, more than 15,000 
fragments in a square meter of the beach. You know, it was just, you couldn't see the sand anymore. Wow. Um, and these, of course, are items that have been in the water for a long time. I mean, those fragmented pieces are probably pieces of, of plastic that entered the water, you know, in the ocean like 50 years ago and then are continuing to be fragmented and standing on our beaches, going inside our, being ingested by seabirds, turtles. Yeah. I think that's, it's an incredibly poignant point and appreciating that obviously the advent of plastic in, you know, predominantly post Second World War in the 50s was revolutionary. And obviously it made so many more things easier. It's, it's light, it's durable, it's flexible, and obviously incredibly long lasting. And I appreciate that we're obviously now seeing so much of that collecting in our waters, but also that we're still producing and actually producing now more plastic than we've ever produced. And we're, there isn't any, any kind of indication that that's going to slow. So dare I say you'd imagine that you'd be seeing more over time plastic pollution, not just on the Azores, right? But certainly in many coastal communities, beaches, islands or otherwise. Yeah, although I think now for probably the past five years, there's been a, a real conscious awareness, I would say. I mean, a lot of effort has been done to sort of reduce the, or the use of, of different plastic items. For example, the you know the recent bans on single-use plastics. But this is going to take a lot of time just to be noticed, you know, in our, in our data because, as you said, there the, there's been so much coming in, and the thing that they're fragmenting still. So the, the amounts are. I mean, we're still trying to understand actually how much is coming in. It's really hard to. It seems like an easy exercise to do, but there's still a lot of debate within the scientific community to, to really define how much there is, how much is entering, where is it going actually, because. When we're looking at what is stranding our beaches and what is compared to what is coming in, there's something missing. And a lot of people are thinking that they actually ends up in the in, in the seafloor. But we don't know where because, of course, it's not homogeneous. So there must be some hotspot on the seafloor that we're, we're still trying to discover. But what I would just want to say is that, yeah, there, it seems to be that there is an effort in, in decreasing the amount of plastics coming in. But it will take a lot of time before this is going to be noticed and before... Uh, before there's going to be a real effect on the fact that these animals are, will not be eating them anymore. I think that's a really good point. At the moment, we obviously have so much plastic that we can see. Obviously, it gets washed up on our beaches, unfortunately. And the expedition that the three of us were on in the Azores, obviously trawling for surface water plastics. But presumably, there's a ton of stuff, as many things in the ocean actually sink to the bottom. So understanding where plastic is settling on the deep seabed and what impact it's even having in those areas 11 kilometers down in the abyss, which we aren't as capable of accessing and researching so easily. So appreciating this is a all encompassing and all kind of pervasive pollution problem, right? I mean, it can literally get everywhere and has got everywhere also into our human systems. And I guess that is something that you've been working really hard on over the last years, Roman, is the impact of microplastics in particular on human health and I won't even try and explain the kind of work that you've done because it's incredibly complicated and incredibly intelligent, but even to the point of recreating the human intestine cell structure in order to test the impact and uptake of microplastics into our human body. Why is that interesting? Why is it important? And, and what have you found so far? I mean, obviously, the question always popped up what the plastic might have to do in regard of human health, like to us, you know, health-wise, because, I mean, it's a one thing that the plastic is in the environment, but we do have, we do know that all the aquatic organisms like fish and specifically mussel do take up those plastics and we consume them. And so the question obviously popped up, okay, so what does it mean now for us? Is there any harm on us or not? And if so, what, what might it be? And the community just like seven years ago started to try to focus on that. And I hopped on this topic at the very early stage. And I came up with the idea to, to set up this 3D human intestinal model which should be kind of like a template model allowing us to figure out what might be an adverse effect or if plastic can maybe provoke an adverse effect no matter what it is if it's a toxicity effect or if it's a pro-inflammatory or inflammatory effect for example so appreciating obviously trying to mimic the very cell structure of our intestines and whether or not our own cells are actually absorbing microplastics what did you find and what was missing? What, what's the next step after that piece of research? 
So first of all, I mean, there is already quite a lot of scientific proof that we do consume plastics like microplastics. On one side, the main exposure route is, for example, via ingestion. Huh? So food uptake or intake, like seafood, but also like bottled water or tap water. There is proof that we can find some microplastics in bottled water, but also in tap water or, for example, in table salt or even in beer. And this most often has something to do with the production side of those products. And yeah, so we do know that we are exposed to this plastic and we ingest it and we even though inhale it. And so the point was, okay, we tried to figure out with this 3D model if there is any adverse effect. And what I did was I took different environmentally relevant materials, for example, like polyurethane, which is being used for all the running shoes for the shoe soles or a polyamide which is also called nylon which is the main material for all the fishing nets and polypropylene which is a very common packaging plastic as well as polyethylene and the point was so we exposed the model or I exposed the model to those different microplastics and I was aiming to see if there is, for example, any cytotoxic effect within time. So letting the material sitting on the cells for up to two days and there was no cytotoxicity measurable or visible. And on top of that, I also checked if there might be a connection to a pro-inflammatory reaction. So can it be that a microplastic at a certain size is provoking a response of an immune cell on the material itself, expressing some molecules called cytokines, cytokines, which are molecules like signaling molecules, which are involved in the inflammatory cascade. And we nicely could see that there is no effect, as there was no expression, no severe or statistically significant expression of those cytokines on the materials test. But it's also very important to mention here that the size that we used of those plastics uh, compared to the size of the single cell was like five, if not 10 times, was the material was five times bigger than the size of a cell. And the point is, so if you want to do show, or it's very important that the immune cells, for example, can properly interact with whatever is out there. So on one side, the purpose of the immune cells is to phagocytose, so to ingest a foreign compound or like a bacteria or a molecule, whatever it is, tries to digest it to figure out what it is and then to show all the other immune cells involved into the immune cascade to fight or to, against, against this foreign material or particle or bacteria, whatever it is, organism. And so size is really an important thing here. And the size that of the materials we have used was, as I mentioned before, was like five times bigger than the size of such a cell. Now you can maybe ask yourself, yeah, why did you do that? I mean, at that very moment, when we did this study, that was four years ago, five years ago, we were just, we did that in collaboration with a company, with a plastic producing company, and they were just able to produce those materials for us at that, to down to this certain size level. Nowadays, we improved the process. We were able, even though, to produce nanoplastics. And the point will also be to use this model again and expose it and also to nanoplastics and to, or just in general to smaller size microplastics where we do know size-wise there can, an uptake can happen via an immune cell and you have to see what happens then. Huh? So. so the next step is really to get even smaller pieces of plastic, which perhaps are tiny enough for our cells to interact with them and then perhaps be better able to see whether or not either plastic inflames our cell structure or aggravates it somehow or I guess the worst case would be in some ways absorbs it and whether or not the toxins or otherwise that are in the plastic or on the plastic get taken up by our human system. So the next step involves both. So on one side, the production of smaller size plastics down to nanoplastics. And we have already done that. We will soon publish this work until the end of the year, I hope. And on the other side, it also involves the improvement of the model because you need to adapt the model. And you it's just the model. That's the point. It's just mimicking an in vivo situation, but it's an in vitro situation. And you're still kind of like far away from the in vivo 
situation. So you need to improve the model. And specifically, if it's then about smaller sized plastics, you need to bring in more different cell types because if you, from an anatomical point of view, if you do look on our intestinal tract, it's quite a complex organ. And trying to mimic that, it's not easy at all. And so therefore, it's always like, if you do see such, such data like or such experiments like the one that I have conducted right now with this model, you always need to digest it in a smooth way, like kind of like, you cannot just take that now for granted and say like, ah, okay, look, they, they did this study. They didn't see any adverse effect and that's it. So ah, nothing will happen. That's not true. I mean, at the end of the day, the main aim from this study, for example, was to to show like what should we do or can we do if it's about human health, what's the right way to go for like with those models because from an ethical point of view, there is no other way that as we cannot just feed a person with, with plastic, it's just not possible. And so if you try to approach that, how do you want to do that? And you can also not just take an organ and inject or whatever plastic into an organ because the organ needs to be be alive. And so it's super complex. So the this in vitro model was it's just like the first step of how to tackle those issues. Yeah. So it's both sides. So we have to improve those models and come up with better models, maybe also like some more specific models, because if you do look on different diseases like a bowel disease or so, you do know that you have a permanent inflammation state in the tissue. And you can mimic that, that's possible, though such models do exist. And I mean, the other thing is then also to go maybe a step further and not just stick on the model of the intestinal model, but also like on lung models, as we do know that we do breathe in fibers, nylon fibers, et cetera, et cetera, textile fibers, which are synthetic because so of plastic based. And this is really like the next direction. This is almost just the beginning, right? So appreciating that because as Chris mentioned, it's a relatively new area of science to be investigating. Whilst plastics have been around for decades and we've been using them for decades and they've been entering our environment for decades, we're still at early-ish stages of understanding just what impact they're having on certainly the, the human immune system and the functioning of our bodies. And to your point, I mean, you know, we've seen even in the last 12 to 18 months, two years, that plastic has been found pretty much everywhere. I mean, it's it's raining plastic and it's been found in every major ice sheet on the planet and the top of Mount Everest. I mean, it really is everywhere and incredibly pervasive. And I guess the real question is, we almost have to, whether or not it has an impact on us, we almost have to clean up what is already out there, but also stop the flow of it in the first place. There's a, almost like a two element approach to making sure that this issue gets solved in the future. Of course, we have to reduce, we will always have to clean up. I think this is going to be a real big challenge. I mean, the more, we, the more we're studying, the more we're realizing that there is so much, uh, such a large emission of, of these particles that to be able to reduce is going to be a big challenge and clean up is even bigger. But I'm still, you know, sort of optimistic that things are going to, you know, we're going to find a way to reduce the, the environmental footprint. I mean, in the sea, because on land, I think it's already too late. In the sea, there's probably ways to prevent the input of plastic to flow in at that scale that we're seeing now. And there is people, you know, really ingenious ideas of cleaning up. I mean, preventing more. Because I think once it's in, in the open ocean, once in the deep sea, it's impossible to, to go and clean up. I mean, just imagine a, an ROV mission in the high seas at 2,000 meters is almost 50,000 euros a day, you know. So, And with a dive of one hour, you cannot clean nothing basically the challenges of and the technical challenges and the financial challenges of cleaning up once it's out there it's just impossible but we really have to focus on you know preventing at the source of course with waste management but also with systems in the rivers to prevent and there's a lot of different technologies that are out there to prevent at least the larger items to go in the oceans i think it's a really important point and obviously goes back to the to the relatively well-known fact that most of our pollution in the ocean comes from our life on land. And certainly when it comes to plastic pollution and packaging and otherwise, that's all all belongs here at home and in our daily lives, which ultimately ends up in rivers and waterways and being washed out to sea. What is it that perhaps is that you're most concerned about? And I appreciate the plastic as a controversial topic, and I know that we need it, but what is it perhaps that you feel like we're not understanding or taking enough action on? For me, it's clearly awareness because if you, I mean, if you do look on this plastic 
problem, then you can yeah, d d divide it into like the environmental problem that we have, like all the plastics ending up in our environment. And then on the other side, like the human health aspect where you have to say, okay, sometimes we even though get exposed to plastics where you can like not choose. I mean, just because of the production side, the plastic is in the food or whatever. But when it, we do talk about the plastic that ends up in the environment, that it's solely, we solely talk about us and our behavior. And we can change that. And it's very simple because if we do change that, then we don't have to talk about anymore about like solutions of how to clean up the mess. Because I honestly, that's my personal opinion, I think we will not be able to do that. It's way too late for that. And it's not the right thing to do. It's good to do it if there is a way of maybe removing bigger sized stuff, but there is no chance anymore to clean up the ocean, okay, or the oceans. And so it's all about awareness. And I mean, we can really push that big time and, and teach our kids, like all the youngsters and in, in school, like how to behave and to really take care about that. And that's what it is. And with this, we have like, I think the biggest key in our hand to solve this problem. And Chris, what about you? What do you feel is the thing that worries you the most or the thing that you feel we're not truly understanding yet on a broad level? There's different aspects. Like I said before, one, one thing that, that worries me a bit is really the interaction between all these different stressors and because we're talking a lot about plastic, but there's pollution in general, you know. Marine pollution is a big subject. It's not only about plastics and they all interact together and we really don't understand in any field of research of, you know, anthropogenic impacts. We always look at things independently and that's now we know that each of them have impact, but now we really need to know how things interact and how we should look at, at this as a global, you know, global threats that needs to be tackled all together. So I think this is really what worries me is that we probably understand that there's impacts about these our activities in the oceans and on the planet in general. We already demonstrated that there is impact, but now what is left to be discovered is probably even much worse. And that's what worries me. And what worries me, for example, is now we're, we're talking about um, exploiting the deep sea minerals. Um, you know, deep sea mining is something that is probably going to happen even if we were trying to fight against it. I think it's quite obvious that in the near future it's going to happen. And we're still going to let it happen without good regulatory framework, without knowing what type of impacts, because it takes time to study and the good way would be to really do a good impact assessment before allowing these kind of activities. But because there is much more pressure from the general society of getting those minerals, it's going to happen even if we know that it's going to be really bad. So these things are, are happening faster than the research can cope with and to, you know, to provide good advice on how to minimize our impact. So I think that's what worries me more. I mean, in the general framework of things, looking at just plastic pollution on its own, what worries me it's just that it will take a lot of time, even with the new policies that are, are you know, are happening now. It's going to take a lot of time before we see something like a clean ocean. And now it's, you know, when I go to the beach with my daughter and we're seeing a lot of plastics in the Port Pim Beach, which, which you've seen for her, it's normal. So that's what is, is, is worrying that for them it's normal. And to have a clean beach, it's something that is not, you know, not part of their life. So, yeah. And hopefully it's not going to get worse. I'm not sure. It's incredible to think about, isn't it? And it's that kind of concept of a shifting baseline, like our grandparents experienced nature and had a, had a different kind of a view of what a beach looked like and what the ocean looked like compared to, say, us now. And it's very difficult, obviously, to show people what really good can look like when actually we've never experienced it in our generation in places. But I also think your point on deep sea mining is a good one because, you know, we talked a minute ago about there's a high probability, if not a complete truism, that there's loads of plastic on the seabed, not least because like so much that goes into the ocean, it ends up as almost like marine snow and debris and then falls to the seafloor and settles. So churning up the deep sea is quite a scary thought, not least because it's the biggest carbon store on our planet, firstly, which is a little bit dangerous to start muddling with. But secondly, because there's so much that has been settled there and so untouched and undisrupted for not de just decades, but hundreds of years. And there's obviously going to be some positive feedback loop, I imagine, in starting to touch that environment and meddle with it. And I think to your point, it's obviously driven by our shift to, to new energy sources such as electrics and and battery-powered systems, which require these resources like cobalt 
which can only be found in the deep sea. So there's this real tension between trying to move forward and find alternative solutions and cleaner energy by using batteries, as an example, and lithium and cobalt versus actually protecting what's already a disrupted ecosystem and potentially pushing it to an even further state of disruption, which we just don't know what could cause. Yeah, and when you think about the minerals, what they're found in, in, in these deep ecosystems, these are ecosystems that are really, really fragile. I mean, it's really, it's, we don't have any equivalent on land of that much of fragile they are. And these are areas that are really cold. Everything is really slow. Animals grow really slowly. They reproduce maybe you know once every four or five years. It's hard for people to really picture that it's completely different with what we're seeing. It's not like even, you know, like a forest, a tropical forest, which also takes time to establish itself. Things are faster. Over there, it's a completely different pace of time. So if you go there and just mess a little bit around, you know, it's taking thousands of years to recover to where it was. So that's another thing that is this kind of ecosystem cannot, you know, deal with any stress. And like you said, they have a really important service. They're providing a lot of services in different for different for our, ourselves, but also for, for the regulatory, you know, planet. So if we mess around this this large biome, it's going to take a lot of time to recover, and it might impact us in a you know negative feed loop that we haven't thought about yet. So I wouldn't mess down over there. But as you said, there's a lot of pressure from society to go and exploit those areas. I'm not saying that we cannot exploit them. There's probably a way to do it, but we have to really think about it and we. Really invest in science, long-term science projects to understand how we could probably use them. Not like a three-year project where you just find, give a little bit of money for people to go in there because the more we go, the more we, we know that we don't know. You know? So mm. it's, uh, Fair point. it's tricky. And obviously, probably the most important note to end on in a way, appreciating that there's a lot of work still to be done, but the way things are looking, we appreciate we've got to do something, we've got to act. What do you feel most positive about like what do you see happening in your respective fields that not necessarily gives you hope but makes you feel that we're starting to understand things we're starting to get it and that we can have a positive impact on on the trajectory roman i think that within the scientific community it's nice to see that this movement is really moving into the right direction i mean people are starting more and more to collaborate and to trying to tackle the problem together and join forces and really like trying to setting up projects together also and that's that's super nice to see you know because most often i mean science is a very competitive field and also the micro nanoplastic field is super competitive but it's i think specifically if it's about environmental problems it's not about being competitive anymore at all but it's like being like straight up joining forces and work together and do good work and this is for me like from a scientific point of view really nice to see very good answer and i think it's incredibly it's interesting isn't it because i think there's nothing in some ways more uniting across industries and across respective fields as an urgent topic and something as urgent as the very planet we're living on and the very environment that we're relying upon chris what about you what are you seeing that is super exciting and perhaps motivating yeah, I agree also with Roman's opinion, or Roman's view on, on there's more and more people are more working together trying really to solve this. There's a lot of initiatives globally trying to tackle the issue. And you see, and you really see like people are getting really, you know, enthusiastic about it. So I really hope there's, I'm really seeing there's a change. Now I hope this is going to be fast enough. So yeah, globally, I think there people are, are related to that issue. Maybe more than other issues that are probably more important still. But still, it's one thing that is important to, to get people attention. And I think the public are, are getting a good image of, a good notion of the problem. Because it's really graphic. Problem. It's really easy for people to relate to. It's something that you can change you know, yourself. Mm-hmm. So, yeah. And something you can see. I think that's the, perhaps the, dare I say it, fortuitous thing about something like plastic and ocean pollution in this crudest sense is that you can see it and you can see it relating to the products that you use and how often you use them and where they end up in comparison to say a much harder conversation to get people involved in such as climate change, which is always a bit more abstract to everyday life in some senses. But Dr. Christopher Pham and Dr. Roman Lena, thank you so much for joining me. It's always a pleasure to speak with you both. And we very much look forward to seeing what further research you come out with and how we can learn even more about the impact that 
our everyday activities and our use of plastic in particular is having on our environment and particularly our waters. Thanks for having us. great. Thank you both. You've been listening to the Clean Sailors podcast. All relevant links to the projects and people we talk to can be found with the podcast link. For all episodes or to get in touch, just visit cleansailors.com. We love to hear from you. We believe that great ideas should be shared, which is why our podcast is free to appear on. So if you've got a project, idea or topic you think we should be discussing, get in touch. In the meantime, thank you for listening and see you for the next episode.